Good morning, everyone, and welcome to another Facebook Live from Alzheimer's Orange County. As always, I'm your host. I'm the Director of Education at Alzheimer's Orange County. My name is Melissa Klabe, and I'm joined this morning, as I am once a month, by Dr. Miriam Galindo. Hey, Dr. Galindo. Good morning. And uh, today we're going to be talking about, well, we always talk about topics near and dear to our heart, but uh, we're going to be talking about what this concept of resiliency is, what it means to be a resilient care partner. Um, before we dive in, I want to thank our sponsor for today's session, Caring Companions at Home. And uh, they are a great sponsor of ours, wonderful community partner. Um, they're committed to providing seniors with quality in-home care. They have personalized care. It's affordable. They give clients companionship they need to maintain independence while remaining in the comfort of their home. And they have a four-step process. They have care manager home visits. They develop a detailed plan of care. They have a a caregiver matching system to ensure the best fit, and of course, periodic visits to assess and modify their care. Um, if you're interested in learning more and need their services, please visit caringcompanionsathome.com. And again, we are super thankful for their sponsorship, as always, uh, this month for our Facebook Live series. And so this morning, as I mentioned, I'm joined by Dr. Glinda. She is a licensed psychologist, licensed social worker, registered nurse. Uh, we call her the triple threat. She has over 30 years of experience and also a former longtime caregiver for her late father, Henry, who was diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease. And so, um, as I mentioned today, we're going to talk about this concept of what is resiliency? How do we develop that as care partners? Um, both Dr. Galindo and I have been through years of caregiving uh, on a personal level and navigating those those roller coasters, right? The joys, the challenges, mm -hmm. oftentimes just trying to make sense of this journey that we find ourselves on. Um, so the goal of today is just to get a little perspective, um, you know, as always also to learn some practical things we can do um, to hopefully make these days as joyful as possible, as life giving as possible, um, and just kind of learn together how we can navigate what's probably the biggest marathon that most of us will travel. Um, so I'm excited to dive into what you found mm -hmm. in your research, your experience in this area. Um, Dr. Galindo gave a webinar on this topic back in May. We do monthly webinars. You know, it's kind of difficult to keep straight what is Facebook Live, what is Zoom, what is a webinar. Um, but we've been doing these webinars way before pandemic times. Um, and we have uh, professionals and community members come together. And so she did a, a really in-depth webinar on this topic. And so we're dividing up uh, what she presented into two parts. So we'll do part one today, and then we'll finish it up next month when she joins me again. Um, as always, please, uh, we want this to be interactive. Share your comments, your questions with us. Um, as we go along, we'll, we'll try and uh, work those into the conversation. Um, so Dr. Glindo, shall we dive mm -hmm. in? Yes, we should. So um, the first thing that comes to mind when we talk about the concept of resiliency is, is how is it relevant to dementia caregiving? And this first slide breaks um, things down into two major categories. The first is that more than any other caregiving role, um, Caregiving for your loved one with dementia is distinguished from any other care, type of caregiving. And that is because there's an element of sustained vigilance that's commented on in the literature. You, when you're caring for your loved one with dementia, you're always on, as most of you know, from the minute you wake up to the time you go to bed, even throughout the night, you dream about it, you, you wake up to it, you worry about it, you're always thinking, 20 steps ahead for this loved one who's gradually losing his or her ability to think for herself. And then secondly, there's the other part of it that demands resiliency is more than any other type of illness. Dementia um, carries with it a strong level of ambiguity and uncertainty. And as we know, human beings love control. We, we operate with um, we operate best when there's predictability and patterns. And unfortunately with dementia, there's so many unknowns. There's no cure, there's no timeline. Um, sometimes like in the case of Alzheimer's, there's not even a clear uh, definitive diagnosis until after death. So every day you're going through anticipatory grief over the loss of someone to this disease that you have no idea where it's going. Um, and uh, you've, and so both of these concepts combined together create a lot of stress. 
So the next slide talks about that stress response. And to understand what happens under these conditions, you, you have to know that your body automatically goes into a stress response when it's faced with a perceived threat. So whenever it's exposed to what it sees as a dangerous stimuli, a portion of the brain called the amygdala reacts with, metaphorically speaking, alarm bells, which then communicates to another part of the brain called the hypothalamus, which then activates a body-wide network of uh, nerve responses in the sympathetic nervous system. And that's just a fancy way of saying automatically your body's going to either try to run or try to fight. Um, and pretty much it's a way of protecting you. In the short term, well, let's talk about the symptoms first, and then we'll talk about what happens to your body. So when your body goes into a stress response, all the blood is diverted to the areas that need it the most, the areas that are necessary for either fighting or running. Uh, the areas that are deprived of blood flow are, are um, uh, we'll talk about as far as symptoms are concerned, but the, but the signs and symptoms of stress are dilation of the pupils, dry mouth, fast breathing, heart pounding, tense muscles, slower digestion, because again, that's not necessary for either running or fighting, right? And sweatiness of the palms. So all of these are happening on, on an automatic basis. The next slide explains something just by way of a picture, and that is in the short term, this is a good thing. It's gonna save your life. If somebody runs in front of a car, your car, and you slam on the brakes automatically, and then you're trembling and you're short, short of breath and your heart rate's up, and you not only saved your life, you saved theirs, right? So in the short term, that level of automatic, that stress response is a good thing. But over the long term, which is what you're gonna see in this next slide, it's not a good thing. Chronic stress, when, when this sympathetic nervous system is activated, chronic stress releases um, several hormones, cortisol, norepinephrine, and adrenaline. And again, in the short term, those, that's great because that's what activates all those responses. But in the long term, it can cause some damage to your body. So chronic stress, according to the literature, can result in anxiety and depression. It can result in digestive problems. It can result in headaches, heart disease, because your vascular system is constricted, but your heart is beating quickly and hard and fast. And so a lot of blood is trying to get through a very, very constricted blood um, structure. There could be heart disease over the long term, sleep disruption, suppressed immunity. If you've got high levels of cortisol churning through your body, it's going to affect your cell replication. And so you're gonna have uh, suppressed immunity and difficulties in that area. Um, and, um, and memory problems, even the literature would say that you as a caregiver, I as a caregiver, Melissa as a caregiver, put ourselves at risk for even things like dementia if we allow ourselves to be subjected to these hormones over a long period of time. So these two slides are telling us, hey, this is great for the short term, but over the long term, we have to have um, a key to um, surviving this, to transcending this, tra uh, this stress response and, and helping our bodies um, create peace in the midst of a storm. Enter resiliency. <laughs> I want to pause for one second here because we had a question from Vicki who asked, yeah. and because you had mentioned memory problems, can chronic stress lead to Alzheimer's disease? So what would well, you say to that question? So Alzheimer's is a specific type of dementia. And what I can tell you is that the literature is very clear that chronic stress can certainly exacerbate dementia. Now, whether it causes it or not is still up in the air because they're still struggling with what exactly causes Alzheimer's. All they know is that Alzheimer's um, is, corresponds with an accumulation of plaques, amyloid plaques and neurofibrillary tangles. 
what actually puts those plaques and tangles in your brain is unclear. But they certainly see in the literature that there's a correlation between higher levels of chronic stress um, and, um, and the development of dementia later in life. So yeah, I, I, it's, it's, a, it's a semantic issue, Vicki, but I appreciate you pointing that out because certainly it is a risk factor. Yeah, thanks for asking that question. I mean, I just feel like we're learning more and more that there's it's such a multifactorial thing that's, yeah. you know, contributing to a lot of cases of dementia. We see Alzheimer's or not, you know, um, taking care of your heart health. Um, chronic stress definitely plays a role in our mental, emotional, social well-being. And all of those things are so important to try to keep as healthy as possible. And, and that's the goal of today, right? So yes. let's dive into this now what the heck is resiliency yeah so here's the key the key is something called resiliency and resiliency is defined as the ability to adjust to a change and to keep going and not give up despite adversity and then after the adversity is over you don't just go back to the way you were before Resiliency by definition means at the end of all of it, you are a stronger person, you're a better person for it. The question though is, is resiliency innate? Are you born with it? Or can you actually develop it despite you know, the, the, uh, your biological or psychological resources that you're born with? Um, regardless, the research is pretty clear that resiliency, the resilient person, is um, can weather these storms much better than those who do not have these keys to resiliency. And essentially, you protect yourself against physiological and psychological damage um, associated with chronic stress. So we've actually broken down this key, resiliency, into six practical steps because it's all well and good to say, well, resiliency is the key, but if we can't break it down, then it's, it's another source of stress. We actually feel like, well, then why even bother if you're not going to tell me what I'm supposed to do with it? Is it mind over matter? Or is it just bearing down? No, there's actually some things that you can practically introduce into your life that'll build resilience in, uh, you know, despite the circumstances. What we're going to do in this um, lecture today is just cover three of those steps. And then in a future lecture, we'll do the remaining three. That way we can really dive in and um, take some questions and get a bit interactive. So the first that we're going to address, the first um, P, as you notice, these are all P's. You know what, let's go back and let's yeah. just introduce them, Melissa. Um, so just so that you can hold these in your mind, the six P's for resiliency, positivity, recruiting your posse, which is my way of saying, make sure you've got a social circle and a team. Don't try to uh, do the caregiving for dementia as a one man show. That's, that's too hard on the mm -hmm. body and too hard on the mind. Play music, um, take care of your physical health, find purpose and meaning, and practice the feelings. So the ones we're gonna talk about today are positivity, practice, uh, practicing the feeling and playing music. And then we'll get to the other three at a different time. So the first one is uh, positivity. What do I mean by that? What's so positive about dementia, right? Especially on those tough days. Well, those with higher than average levels of resiliency it turns out those are the ones who've reached a place of acceptance more quickly when it comes to this diagnosis and when it comes to our role with this diagnosis. What they have, it turns out, is what's called realistic optimism. This doesn't mean that there's denial inherent. It means definitely that you're seeing the good, you're seeing the bad, but you've accepted this. Um, you're not trying to fight it. And um, those who figured this out um, can also focus on the silver lining that's in this diagnosis. So, you know, I, I want to add a disclaimer here because I've been through it myself on a personal level as well as a professional level, but definitely personal is far more different than professional. 
the process of accepting a diagnosis definitely takes time. And there are days when you accept it. And then there are other days where you're going to feel like, uh, how did I get here? Mm. Right. And um, I can tell you that we all go through these. Um, we've listed here on this slide the process of acceptance. These are borrowed from Kubler Ross's five stages of grief. And you will notice that the stages of acceptance that I've listed here are similar. Um, beginning with denial, anger, bargaining, depression, and sadness, and then finally acceptance. And the reality is you don't just go linearly. You don't start with denial, then go to anger, then proceed to bargaining, then depression. You're going back and forth through those stages throughout this whole process, sometimes even many stages throughout one day. Um, and that's okay. What you're doing is addressing these things layer by layer by layer. And ultimately the hope is uh, for your peace of mind, as well as those around you and, you know, your family unit, that you reach a place of acceptance. And um, because honestly, you, you, um, there's a beauty that is um, achieved and perceived in a place of acceptance that is not available in, in prior stages. At any rate, um, this is when, I, for me, I remember just a, um, you know, a process and then finally reaching this painful epiphany that this disease is not gonna go away. And, um, and that's certainly a devastating moment. I'm sure most of you have felt um, the depth of that pain um, but you know, there's no right way to do it. And some days are going to be more challenging than others. Just know it doesn't matter how many degrees you have, how, <laughs> you know, what your profession is, you're, you, we're right next to you and what you're feeling we've felt. And, um, and so is everybody else that's watching today. But the bottom line is it's a perspective, this positivity thing. So I I want to mention two things here because I think it's great the way you described it. I want to underscore that. Um, I think what was hardest for me in the beginning was um, having feelings about these feelings. And the predominant yeah. feeling was guilt or being mad at myself for feeling a certain way, yeah. you know, and just not being able to accept that I was in denial or angry or, yeah. you know, trying to. And so just accepting that it's normal to feel that way. There's no wrong way to feel and kind of let yourself sit with it a little bit, then, but then try and figure out how to move forward. I think that was really key. And I got stuck a lot of times feeling yeah. like just going into this feeling spiral <laughs> about, you know, like, is this normal? Am I, you know, what am I supposed to be doing or feeling right now? And lots of guilt mixed in there yeah. was the predominant thing for me. Um, well, and I should point out when you're going through the process of acceptance, different members of the family are going to, remember how we yeah. talked about that level of uncertainty and ambiguity as part of this disease you're gonna find that your family members or those who love the person you love are grasping for control in different ways and at different levels than you are. Mm -hmm. And so while you're maybe in a depression stage, somebody else is in denial. When you're trying to fix something, somebody else is not moving fast enough. And so what you find is sometimes people turn against each other um, and they're frustrated with each other. And if you just take a step back and recognize everybody is feeling the same level of stress, but in different ways, and everybody's trying to grasp control over their own sense of helplessness, it gives you empathy for everybody else and they can have empathy for you. And um, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a very, very challenging disease um, for all of us. Absolutely. I think the, the other thing I want to say about this was acceptance. Um, I think for a lot of people feels like I'm giving up. Yeah. Um, I think that's how it felt for, for some of people close to me. Um, you know, when we we're kind of dealing with my mom's diagnosis initially and how to deal with that and, you know, acceptance felt like, you know, so what now we've accepted it, but yeah. what does that mean? And I, um, that, you know, completely transformed for me over the years of, you know, from no, we're not giving up. We're we're going to explore how to give her the best quality of life possible with the years, yes. whatever years we have with her, um, you know, because that's going to benefit all of us, and and that's, you know, kind of the the journey in front of us right now. So, that's exactly right, and it takes moving away from a value system that's um, pretty typical of our American culture and the value system being um, productivity and yeah. 
if something's broken, fix it quickly. Right. You know, we, we do that. Um, if, a, if a sink is dripping, we call the plumber immediately, right? We don't just sit there and take it. And so it's counterintuitive to say, no, this is not something you fix. And it's more about enhancing the quality of life, as you say, which um, actually is a somewhat of a transcending of our, um, it's a, it's an actual paradigm shift. It's, mm -hmm. it's shifting what we thought was valuable, which is productivity and get things done. And how many things can you get in one day to a place of, um, of peace, of um, recognizing that there is value beyond productivity, that the essence of who a person is, is not about what they can do, but about them as a yeah. human being worthy of dignity and worthy of the best life possible under the circumstances. Absolutely. And yeah. Vicki kind of echoes that acceptance and communication is so important yeah. to let family know how to support each other when caring for your loan. Absolutely. Oh, Thank you great. for that, Vicki. Communication. Perfect, Vicki. Thanks for that. Yeah. Yep. All right. Talk. <laughs> so, um, I think, did we skip the next one about the, um, this was the next one I no, had, but maybe I, okay. maybe I skipped something. Uh, <laughs> so can, yeah, the quote, this is perfect. So the reality of life is that your perceptions, whether they're right or wrong, influence everything you do. So when you get a proper perspective, you may be surprised at how many other things fall into place. And that's kind of what I was talking about when I said there's something beautiful that happens when you reach a place of acceptance that's inaccessible to you in those prior stages. You can say all day long, well, I'm feeling, you know, this is how I'm feeling. Yeah. But until you reach a place of acceptance, it's there, there's something else that happens. It's like a door opens wide to a world you didn't even know existed. Mm -hmm. I, I can't even explain it, but those of you who've been there know what I'm talking about. It's just a piece. Um, and it's, it's, um, it helps you recognize and slow down and um, appreciate and express gratitude and, and um, just those seconds and minutes and days in life that are filled with a lot of joy if you look for it. Yeah. So here's a little exercise on how powerful perspective is. And so Melissa, I'm going to have you um, be my audience, my okay. verbal audience. And you're going to take a look at the upper left screen of those two guys that are squabbling about the, the sticks on the ground. All right. And I want you to take a look at the sticks. And if you look at them from the perspective of the person on the left, how many sticks do you see? I see four. Okay. And if you look at the sticks from the perspective of the guy on the right, how many sticks do you see? See three. Yeah. So now if you can see the elephant down at the bottom of the mm -hmm. screen, and I'm hesitating because I was thinking, did the frame cut it off? But I think we're okay. Oh, yeah. And I know this I is really okay. small for people, probably, especially if you're watching on your phone, maybe computer iPads a little better. But again, if mm -hmm. anyone ever wants uh, copies of the slide, you can feel free to email yeah. learn at alzoc.org. So, yeah. all right, I'm looking at the elephant. Okay. So look at the elephant from the top down and tell me how many feet you see. Top down, I see three feet oh yep yeah what's yep. going on <laughs> <laughs> you see no Rise feet checked. <laughs> isn't that funny how our brains fill in the blanks yeah um but if you look from the bottom up you definitely see how many feet uh four yep. yeah oh one so is if like you look from the top to down no <laughs> and if you look from the bottom up there's four feet and this exercise is just a graphic illustration of what I'm talking about. Perspective is key. You know, there are some philosophers who will say, uh, well, things just are, that's the way it is. No, it's not. It's <laughs> our interpretation of things that defines what is and what not is. And, <laughs> and the reality is if we wanna test that hypothesis, just ask somebody with dementia, to interpret the world around them. Yeah. It's according to one's perception. In fact, boy, did I learn a lot from my dad while he was going through dementia, right? Yeah. It's all about your perspective. So this is what I mean by realistic optimism. It's not denial. 
the circumstances certainly remain the same, but it's that you're making a conscious decision to look at it from a different perspective. Instead of seeing it from one perspective, you're going to see it from another. Instead of thing, saying, you know, seeing things as all bad or awful or this is just tragic, you're going to see it as another season of life and that it's a privilege to be there and I'm going to get through it and this is how I'm going to do it. Mm -hmm. um, so how do we do this? Because it's all well good. It's all well and good to say, just look at it from a different perspective. Um, but there are some practical steps you can take to actually introduce positivity in your life. The first is what we talked about before with changing that paradigm, changing that mindset or your vision. So the previous goal, as we talked about before, is task accomplishment and productivity. How many things can you cram into one day? How many things can you fix that are broken? We need to replace that, I have found, with a new goal, which is more joy than not, an elimination of pain, elimination of fear. That's quality of life right there. And if you can accomplish that for your loved one in the day, you can count yourself as a, a wonderful caregiver and you can count that day as a success. Don't worry about how many dishes are still in the sink. Sink. Don't worry about whether your loved one has five layers of clothes on. It's more joy than not, the elimination of pain, the elimination of fear. And then the steps you can take to increase that realistic optimism, you strive toward a place of acceptance. Why do I say strive? Because it's not just you get there and then you stay there. It's a constant, you know, um, you know, stepwise progression toward conscious decision making on a daily basis sometimes. Number two, you see the challenges, you get information, and then just be willing to take action. Just your job is just to accompany your loved one on this journey, and there's going to be confusing signposts along the way, and you just get informed, and then you say, Okay, we're going to go to the next stop. It's kind of like when your GPS, you know, you go in the wrong direction and it says, um, recalibrate, yeah. recalculating, Make <laughs> turn. you know, it's, it, it's okay. You, you went down the wrong path. Your GPS is going to take, tell you to go in a different direction. So just be willing to make those U-turns and then just know when you get the information, your confidence is going to increase your optimism is something that you know you're going to actively refuel by some of the steps that we're going to teach you today and when you have confidence plus optimism you're going to feel more motivated it's going to naturally increase your energy the fourth point is really important to get to a place of positivity it's um, a good practice to catch the words you're saying to yourself so for example one of the things that's kind of an easy catch is when we say things like, well, I have to go to the store today, or I have to go to Los Angeles today. And a better idea is instead of being a victim of your words and saying, I have to, I have to, I have to catch yourself and say, I choose to go to the store at 12 instead of two. Yeah. I choose to get on the freeway at nine instead of 12. <laughs> you know, so you even the choice of words can develop positivity and catching the negativity that you yourself are saying in your own mind. I'm not sure if you have something to add to that, Melissa. I'm sure some thoughts came to mind. Yeah. I mean, I've just, I feel like I've been reading so much in the past several years about these researchers looking into the impact that just practicing gratitude has on our, no matter our situation, especially for caregivers, I think, but um, for any of us, you know, just even the simple act of, of writing a few things down that, that you're grateful for um, at the end of the day or sharing that with somebody um, writing a thank you note, it, like all these things have real impacts on, on mood and um, our, our sense of well-being. And I think we get busy and we often overlook, you know, kind of that. But if we sit down and, and think about how we can practice gratitude, I, um, the days that I've chosen to do that, I've noticed a difference in myself. Yeah. Um, and you do have to choose it and you do have to make a little bit of time for it. And, and if you get into that habit and practice, it gets a little easier. And if you have people around you that are willing to do that with you as well, um, 
but absolutely, I think, I mean, the science and, is clear and our experiences are clear that, um, you know, choosing to do this, um, it's not always easy, but it does pay off and it is worth it for our well-being. And of course, the well-being of the person that, you know, we're, we're yeah. caring for. And Vicki added something that is just so important. I think changing your thoughts, changing yes. your situation certainly begins with changing your thought life. And I want to add one more thing as we talk about optimism, surrounding yourself with, um, you know, quotes or, or um, inspiring, um, you know, passages from the books you read from, yeah. from your faith group, um, sticking them on your refrigerator, on your closets, around your mirror, all of those things penetrate over time. They're little seeds that'll grow in your mind and um, they're not lost. Um, so even if it feels like, my gosh, I've got 50,000 quotes taped all over my house, just keep looking at them, say them out loud. Uh, they, will, they will become intertwined in your mind. And before you know it, you will have that confidence and that optimism that'll energize you um, throughout your day. It's true. I, I just wanted to share real quick. I found, a, I was going through some of my mom's stuff and found a quote that she had written. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not the weight of the load. It's the way that you carry it. I think yeah. it's a Mary Oliver. I'm not sure exactly who originally said that, but um, I carry that in my wallet actually. And I, oh. I forget about it sometimes and then I kind of rediscover it. And, but I, it's always in the forefront of my mind. And, and just the fact that it came from her and it's in her yes. writing and something that she believed in, that means a lot to me too. Oh, and yeah. um, so that's, that's always been a powerful one for me. Perfect. 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 So now that takes us to the second strategy, which is practicing the feelings. So we talked about our thought life. Now let's talk about our emotional life. And just like our thoughts, um, it, it, there's empirical data that would suggest that you can be in charge of your feelings. Your feelings don't need to dictate your experience. You can dictate your feelings. And the evidence behind that is, is in this picture here in the quote above it. Does happiness make you smile or is it the other way around? And the research, not just my impression, the research <laughs> actually says the smile can actually precede a happy feeling. So it turns out that a smile triggers neurons in your brain to internalize a feeling that corresponds with a smile. In other words, your happiness follows a smiling face. When your brain sees a smiling face, it starts to feel happy. It's apparently the brain is not that smart. <laughs> um, and, that's, and that's a good thing. Easily <laughs> so that's good. We can go about tricking our brain. So uh, what does that mean? Do you have to see a smiling baby or can you look at your own smiling face? Well, the research actually involved your own smiling face. I saw two pieces of research. One was... Um, involving uh, people smiling in a mirror for several minutes and um, just looking at your smiling face. And then they would measure, um, you know, after that event, did, um, did it actually result in increased happiness? And sure enough, it did. The other was, I believe, some kind of um, sticks that participants held in their mouth to kind of pry their mile, <laughs> their mouths into a smile, which is funny. They don't even have to try to smile, just prop your mouth up into a smile. And apparently it did the same thing. Oh. The participants actually endorsed higher levels of happiness. Now, the other thing we know, especially when we look at pictures like this of a baby smiling, is that smiling is contagious. If you're smiling, people in your family are going to be smiling. The People at the cash register are going to smile. The grumpy person in the parking lot is going to smile. And your loved one's going to smile. And when they smile, you smile. It's contagious. It's like the, the level of contagion that we always see with a yawn, right? The mm -hmm. one person yawns, you yawn. Yeah. Um, and that leads me to my next um you I've know, been um, trying to practice smiling with a mask on. It's difficult, but I think I've got yeah. enough of it <laughs> when I'm in the grocery store. <laughs> you know, it's interesting, too, because I have to see a lot of um, clients with mm -hmm. a face mask is I actually find myself um, exaggerating the smile yeah. in my eyes. <laughs> 
um, because they can't see my mouth. Yeah. That's how powerful a smile is. And someday I'll leave it, you know, sometimes I'll even say, I'm smiling right now. Yeah, you can pull see down it. my mask so you <laughs> yeah. can see I'm smiling. Because it actually elevates the mood of the person you're with and vice versa. It's, it's, this mask is actually kind of a hindrance. Yeah. So with that, let's talk about the result of a smile and, you know, happiness. And that is this laughter. What precedes uh, laughter? Is it the smile? Is it the happiness? Is it the laughter? Well, again, just like the smile turns out, if you laugh, you will have measurable signs of increased happiness in your brain and lower levels of depression. So you can pretend to laugh or you can turn on um, a movie or a YouTube uh, trailer or a video that is, you know, cat videos <laughs> and anything that makes you laugh and do that several times in a week or a month. Um, the research would say you only need to do it four times a month. And really? it actually results, yeah, it actually results in lower blood pressure, <laughs> lower heart rate, lower salivary concentration of um, stress hormones and increased serotonin, which is helpful, by the way, serotonin, low levels of serotonin correlate with depression. So if you can boost that serotonin level, you'll feel less depressed. So yeah, four times a month sounds low to me. Why <laughs> deprive yourself? Turn on the happy yeah. movies as much as possible. <laughs> yeah. And honestly, with the internet, there's no reason not to they're just at your fingertips you've got them on your phone you've got them on your internet and i'm giving you permission to go down the rabbit hole of funny videos and um and laugh whether you feel like it or not you're going to start laughing right yeah. um, and if you don't feel like it fake it at first and believe me that's contagious as well absolutely but do you see how there are physiological changes it's not just an impression. This is actually empirically um, tested. This is um, uh, evidence-based ways to reduce that chronic stress so that you survive mentally and physically this journey ahead of you. Definitely. So why is it important to practice a feeling? Well, like we said before, um, there's, you know, mental and physical consequences of, um, of chronic stress. But let's break it down. Depression actually weakens the immune system. Depression does. And the immune system is not just about you catch a cold faster. It means your ability to resist a degradation of your very cells is at stake so you you want to resist depression you, you it, it's not good for the soul but it's also not good for the body laughter releases endorphins it increases serotonin as we talked about before it measurably reduces physical pain there have been studies to prove that that when there's um uh, laughter and smiling and increased sense of well-being, there's a reduction in perception of pain. Um, it boosts the immune resistance so that you're not as susceptible to chronic diseases. It decreases heart rate and blood pressure, which is more um, protective of your heart. It fosters brain connectivity. There's, there's your answer, Vicki, to you know, um, how your unspoken answer of how can we protect against dementia ourselves? It connects um, us with each other and it ignites hope. And there is just this sense of forgiveness that comes with laughing together. I don't know what it is. I'll have to do more research on that. But the conclusion is that when you're in a room of people who are joking together, and even joking about things that are edgy, everybody's kind of in it together and they're all laughing together. And you even see that in comedy houses that, you know, there's a connection. People are making eye contact, you know, touching each other, laughing together. So it creates this wonderful sense of community. So Clarence Darrow's uh, quote, I state here, if you lose your power to laugh, you lose your power to think. <laughs> Laughter, I'm going to venture to say, actually increases your ability to think creatively, think, creatively, think outside of the box, and um, problem solve. So 
so all the more reason to just laugh, okay? Um, I'm a psychologist. I'm prescribing it today. <laughs> <laughs> Accept it. Yes. Yeah, I think this fits in so well with a lot of, um, you know, we read about caregiving strategies and improv yeah. comedy is such a yeah. big one. It's, you know, um, treat, you know, situations like, like an improvisational comedian, which is don't say yeah. no, never say no. That's the first rule. Um, Always yes. say yes. Yes. And then build off of that. And so, you know, yeah. for us in the beginning, when if my mom would say something that, you know, I knew not to be true or seemed kind of wild, um, you know, first reaction early days was that's crazy. Why would you say that? You know, um, but then I learned uh, about this strategy and um, saying yes and being able to jump in the moment with her and jump into her world and say, wow, that's interesting. And how about this? And and kind of building off of that and build our own little world and, you know, whatever it was, that she, you know, and, and that led to a lots of laughter and just yes. uh, such a sense of ease within me, not having to always feel like I needed to correct her or remind her about things, which never went well, obviously. Um, yes. But but just being able to make that leap into let's let's see what her world is like and how can I join that with her and how can I how can we, you know, just use humor every yes. opportunity possible yeah you're reminding me that one of the toughest jobs i had um caring for my father was trying to <laughs> make shower time a joyful experience yeah. instead of a fight and now looking back at it um it, it, those were the most i had so much fun <laughs> yeah you too. know and and um it, we used to laugh and you know obviously it was it was a challenge but there were so many fun moments that um i now look back with such um joy and it warms my heart um i remember i used to say to my dad oh darling you look marvelous yeah. <laughs> you know because he loved those black and white movies so uh -huh. I, oh you look marvelous and he would say i do oh. and it just it was those little moments are so touching yeah. so touching so um yeah so find mo find find things about find, find things that you can laugh about together always you don't want to laugh at a person mm. you want to laugh with them you want them to join with you in the laughter it it just builds such positive memories sort of for the future absolutely so the third strategy and this is the final one right melissa yeah. for yep. today and we're going to talk about the other three at a different time and this is oh my gosh my all-time favorite <laughs> plain music um studies show that exposure to music and in particular classic music but i'm not going to push that if you don't like classical <laughs> music but it actually has measurable effects on the stress response so this is critical because this is something you can do easily at home. If you turn on your radio to just to a you know low ebb of music playing in the background, something that's calming or um, it, it matches the natural normal resting state of your body, you will find that over time your body is matching the music. So that's why I say classical music. Typically, classical music has a natural rhythm that's going to be consistent with your normal resting state but let's say you like country or you like um, other forms of music that are more pleasing to your ear or let's say the situation dictates that people need to be on task like <laughs> we need to get in the shower and take a shower so you choose something that's more invigorating the key when it comes to your loved one is try to pick something that's familiar and and pleasing to their ears and then you actually um, address two areas. You either invigorate them or calm them. You bring back um, memories to them that are actually spared by the dementia yeah. process. And, um, and then you in turn become calm and restful because you're, you and this person that you love so much with dementia are operating as a team. So this, this, um, key um, that's manifested in playing music is so easy to come by, so accessible, and yet so effective. Um, so I think our, our next slide actually tells us the specifics. Yeah, the research actually says 25 minutes of classical music a day is, is the cutoff point. In other words, don't go under 25 minutes. 
for me, go over 25 yeah. minutes. I mean, do it the whole day long. That's <laughs> the way I feel. But I'll, I'll leave it to you, at least 25 minutes. And what the research says is there are measurable, uh, re there's a measurable reduction in cortisol levels. Remember, cortisol is a stress hormone that when left to its own devices can actually create, um, um, it can destroy cells or the cell replication process. It's, it just erodes the body overall. Um, music also triggers the release of dopamine, which is a feel good uh, brain chemical and hormone. So the more dopamine you feel, you actually have a reduction in a sense of pain and, um, and negative uh, feelings in the body. So dopamine is actually a good thing. Uh, music alters the brainwave activity. It reduces anxiety up to 65%. Um, it lowers blood pressure. It reduces heart rate. And as I said before, it reduces pain. And as we've talked about in our music video that, or mm -hmm. our music um, Facebook, I think yeah. it was that we yeah. did, right? Um, for your loved one with dementia, as I said before, the center that's responsible in the brain for music recognition somehow evades the, the destruction of dementia. Mm -hmm. And so if you also want a way to communicate with your loved one, music um, can surpass the restrictions of rational, logical communication. And it's a way to speak to that person without even using words. So we can even add this to the list, the 25 minutes of classical music a day or whatever music you love and whatever is pleasing to your loved one can actually be a method of communicating to your loved one. Absolutely. So that's a good thing too. Wonderful. Such yeah. a great tool. Yes. Oh, there we go. We know this guy. Yeah. <laughs> so here's just to reinforce again for loved ones with dementia that familiar music is powerful. And you can see in that second point, MRI, MRI studies actually um, corroborate what I'm saying that the um, areas associated with music memory show minimal cortical atrophy and minimal disruption of the glucose metabolism. And so when you present music to your loved one, that area of the brain is able to, um, to synthesize it, to interpret it in a way that the other parts of the brain are not able to interpret the world like they used to, this one can. So there at the bottom right is a picture of my dad and his reaction to his music. And mm -hmm. the reason I used headphones, by the way, is later in the dementia process, um, there's an, a difficulty um, distinguishing between incoming um, stimuli. So, um, and filtering out the stimuli that's, that's um, not a priority, take in the stimuli that is a priority. So I used headphones and that seemed to be super helpful. Um, but yeah, uh, another reason for music, another endorsement. As if we need more excuses, but it's wonderful. Absolutely. Yes, it is. Well, this was great. A great start. Yes. We're going to do the rest of this next month on the 8th. Um, and uh, thank you, everyone, for, for being with us today. And I, I just want to mention a couple other things we have upcoming. Um, we have our Savvy Caregiver series, which is a three-week series that we do monthly. Um, and this is a really incredible series for, for care partners um, with loved ones with kind of in the moderate stage uh, of Alzheimer's disease or another dementia. Um, it's over Zoom, so you'll kind of get to be face to face with others in similar situations and, and work through tons of practical information. And as always, like our education is, it's part support group as well. So you kind of get mm -hmm. that um, support from others. We also have a series that we do monthly called Living Well with Early Memory Loss. And this is meant for people with memory loss with mild cognitive impairment or early dementia and a partner to do together and um, to kind of meet other couples or, or people in, in similar situations. Such a valuable series and we really would encourage you if you know anyone interested, please have them call our helpline or visit our website for more information. Um, we have our walk coming up as well. I, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention it. Of course, we're not gonna be all gathering in Angel Stadium together, unfortunately. Um, but uh, we do encourage you to sign up, build a team and walk wherever you are and you can share um, photos with us and videos. Um, so that's coming up in November. Um, 
And as always, please uh, use our resources. We're, we're here for you. Give us a call, visit our website. Um, we have a, a comment here from Delane. My husband yeah, can was- can you read that? Yeah. It's my, making me smile just to read it. I know, me too. My <laughs> husband was, quote, melting when you suggested smiling. I did, and he smiled Woo! back. That's I love so awesome. that. Um, and it, yeah, I mean, it's it, yeah, it's such a it's powerful magic. tool. It's it's that we have. I hate to even yeah. call it a tool. It's just an emotion. It's just you know part of life that we we well, just want to share with each other. So yeah, and you know, it's so thrilling to be able to find a way to connect with yeah. your loved one, and when you realize they're still in there, I can yeah. still connect. And Vicki Ann talks about her mood yeah. changes yeah. her mother's behavior. It's those are the things that can give us that second win and give us hope that we're going to be able to get through this journey and it lowers our stress and it lowers their stress too. So those are the things we're going to be talking about in our part two yes. on September 8th. And this is just such an exciting topic. And I appreciate that all of you joined today yeah. and you give us your comments. I look forward to reading the comments you're going to give us next time too. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Thank you as always for being with us. Um, thank yeah. you to Caring Companions at Home. Um, for sponsoring this this Facebook Live series this month. And thank you all. Have a wonderful Tuesday, and we'll see yes. you next time. Take all care. Right. Bye, Take Dr. Bye-bye. Have Bye. a good day.